of healthcare resources. And Dr. Kalant testified that cannabis products are so non-toxic that they have yet to kill anyone, even those who smuggle large amounts of concentrated extracts and have the baggies burst in their bodies. <laughs> you can't say that about anything else. Uh, th those are, again, found uh, Dr. Peck from the trial transcripts in Kane from March 8, 1996, Dr. Morgan from January 29, 1997, Dr. Kalant from January 31, 1997. Impaired driving and impaired lungs are the two most often cited reasons for cannabis prohibition, and they are both addressed through harm reduction. Uh, as, again, uh, you can find in Dr. Morgan, Dr. Connolly, and Dr. Clance evidence. Some of these harm reduction regulations are already in place. Impaired driving is already against the law. That should be sufficient to walk a straight line, touch your nose, all those things. And that way, people who are impaired will get stopped no matter what substances they have in their body. And people who aren't impaired will be allowed to go free no matter what substances they have in their body, as should be as it should be. The, the natural health care products, the Food and Drug Act, and organic growing standards are also already in place in Canada, ad addressing many of these concerns, uh, especially with regard to lung damage. Credible education programs and other safe point of sale regulations exist in other countries that could re reduce risks still further. We saved Holland from uh, German New Order uh, we can learn something from them. We could take advantage of their freedom they've exercised. Well, that's the harm reduction side of the argument. Mr. Justices, Madam Justices, Madam Chief Justice, if there is any doubt to any of this argument, if you think I may have missed something, please express it now or at any time before I leave when the doubt has a fair chance of being addressed rather than leave the doubt to your decision, as the lower courts have done every time. Now, I'd like to speak for a moment about the harm principle and autonomy in relation to the harm reduction evidence. The following quote on autonomy is missing from the appellant's factum, but it's worthy of re-examination. It's found in Kane and, and in my case in the lower courts. Our right to autonomy is most clearly articulated by Justice LaForest in B brackets R versus Children's Aid Society, 1995, when, speaking for the majority, she wrote, quote, the individual must be left room for personal autonomy to live his or her own life and to make decisions that are of fundamental personal importance. In my submission, if they are indeed our own lives, it should not matter if the violation of autonomy is a prohibition of our important activities or our less important activities. If there are our own lives, there are our own lives, period. That's where it should end. Referring now to pages 17 to 19 of this appellant's factum, in my submission, the harm principle is indeed a principle of fundamental justice. It is found in On Liberty, and it's also found in Within Rights Number 4 and Rights Number 5 of the Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen, the French Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. This principle was found to be a principle of fundamental justice in the courts below. In the words of Justice Braidwood, quote, you don't go to jail unless there is a potential your activities will cause harm to others. Justice Braidwood specified harm to others instead of just harm. Recognizing true freedom requires the right to risk harm to ourselves. Turning to page 19 of this appellant's factum, Justice Stone said much the same thing when he wrote, history teaches us there have been but few infringements of personal liberty by the state which have not been justified in the name of righteousness and public good and few which have not been directed as they are now at politically helpless minorities. I'm not saying cannabis users are politically helpless, but we certainly have cer certain obstacles to overcome that other people don't have to face. Turning to page 22 and 23 of this appellant's factum, in R versus M bracket C, involving consensual anal sex between young people, the Ontario Court of Appeal struck down the offense as contrary to the charter. In the decision, it was argued that it is not enough for a government to assert an objective for limiting guaranteed rights under Section 1. There must, in my view, also be an underlying 
evidentiary basis to support, to support this assertion. So the new test, now taking into account cannabis harm reduction, should be, in my submission, you don't go to jail unless your activities are inherently harmful to others. But on whose shoulders does the burden of proof rest? Some of the following discussion on burden of proof is missing from my factum, but it relates to pages 17 to 22, and it grows from the, the discussion on the harm principle. Dr. Neil Boyd testified on November 28, 1995 in Kane that there was no evidence of a public health problem in 1923 when cannabis was first criminalized. From the introduction to the 1989 Cambridge edition of On Liberty, we have the following quote. His principle puts the burden of proof on those who propose to restrict the liberty of others. That's from my book of authorities, volume one, tab 14, page XVII. Mill recognized that there was and there would be constant attempts, constant attempts by the legislative or the executive of direct interference with private conduct and the controlling of, quote, individuals in the things in which they have not hitherto been accustomed to be controlled. That's from my Book of Authorities, Volume 1, Tab 14, page 12. It has cost the cannabis community hundreds of thousands of dollars to prove that we are relatively harmless, and the scapegoats of tomorrow may not be in possession of such resources. All of the previous quotes point to the fact that we should not let anyone in this country just point their finger, yell criminal, and then lock up, fine, or otherwise punish thousands of people. We must heed the words of Justice Robert H. Jackson of the Nuremberg War Trials when he said, what the world needs now is not to turn one crowd out into the concentration camps and put another crowd in, but to end the concentration camp idea. That's from a book called The Road to Nuremberg, Bradley F. Smith, 1981. In my submission, to end the concentration camp idea, we need a process that requires a heavy burden of proof of inherent harm to others placed upon the lawmakers, not the recently criminalized. To respect the principle of being presumed innocent until proven guilty found in Article 11 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and Section 11 of this charter, the new test should be you don't go to jail if the state has failed to provide evidence that heavily contested activities will cause significant harm to others even when done properly. Now, I'd like to state a bit on monopoly, jumping to page 26 to 28 of my factum. Bouvier's Law Dictionary includes, quote, the prohibition of unfair monopolies, unquote, within its definition of liberty. In my submission, this is at uh, my Book of Authorities, tab 21. In my submission, the anti-monopoly argument is part of the liberty found in section 7, unless you care to ignore Bouvier. In the margin reference case, the court found that business had to be protected from monopoly or legislation that was for, quote, protecting those engaged in the dairy industry, unquote, legislation unrelated to, quote, public peace, order, security, health, or morality, unquote. That's from this appellant's book of authorities, tab 10, page 48, immediately after the quote, and also the respondent's factum, paragraph 157 and 161. In 1946, natural cannabis tinctures were removed from the shelves of pharmacies only two years after synthetic forms of cannabis were produced. That's from this appellant's book of authorities, volume one, page 189. In Singh, etc., all versus Minister of Employment and Immigration, the court said, the right to security of the person means not only protection of one's physical integrity, but also the provisions of necessaries for its support. John Stuart Mill wrote that civilized society should guarantee, quote, the freedom to unite for any purpose, not involving harm to others. The persons combining being supposed to be of full age and not forced or deceived. This could easily be said of the Harm Reduction Club and most cannabis dealers. Again, I direct you to this appellant's book of authorities, volume one, tab 14, page 16. In my submission, the war on cannabis is a war on a viable agricultural economy, in effect, causing poverty by withdrawing wealth 
from a labor-intensive agricultural industry and concentrating it in a capital-intensive chemical industry. Every beggar I pass by on the street reminds me of this reality. If our rulers are truly serious about concerns over our health, they will allow us the chance to produce Mother Nature's finest crash crop so we can all finally put some good food in the pantry with a little vacation fund left over. Now, finally, returning back to pages 22 to 26 of my factum, issue of equality. In my submission, the harm principle also applies to section 15. Protecting groups of people whose common experience is not so much the disadvantage they have suffered, nor is it the characteristics are deeply held, it is that they are all not considered inherently harmful to others. So for example, you wouldn't add pirates to the list because pirates are inherently a group of inherently harmful people, but any group of people who are not inherently harmful should be added to that list in section 15 as soon as, as, soon as they, they request it. We want as long a list as possible, not as short a list as necessary if we're serious about, about um, avoiding persecution. Section 15 states, every individual is equal before and under the law and has the right to the equal protection and equal benefit of the law without discrimination and in particular without discrimination based upon race, national or ethnic origin, color, religion, sex, age, or mental or physical disability. In my submission, a natural preference to or taste for herbs is a substance orientation. Is this not similar to an enumerated ground such as religion, a philosophical orientation, or a recognized analogous ground, a sexual orientation, as, as in brand? Similarly, why shouldn't a person wishing to choose a vocation, a pursuit, such as a cannabis farmer or cannabis breeder or cannabis cafe owner, who wishes to compete on a fair playing field with the other substance providers, such as the cultivators and distributors of alcohol, tobacco, pills, or coffee products. Um, why cannot the cannabis cafe operators receive vocation orientation protection? Equality, liberty, the right of intoxication, the right to relaxation and well-being, and the usefulness of education to deal with the limited dangers of cannabis were all proudly proclaimed as arguments in favor of the re-legalization of personal amounts of cannabis in the Lubeck decision. Two years later, the higher court threw out this decision by misidentifying the state interest, shifting the focus of the trial from abuse reduction to demand reduction, and then dismissed the effectiveness of education on use rates. The Crown, in the cases before you, have also chosen to see the state interest as being concerned with the preventing use instead of preventing abuse. Uh, I refer you to Kane Miscellaneous Authorities, tab 1, page is 8 to 10, 15 and 31. Um, also, uh, R versus Malma Levine, speech to the Court of Appeal, paragraph 46, and the Respondent's Factum, paragraphs 117 and 123. In the Lubeck decision, it was written that the laws against cannabis possession were, quote, a contravention of the principle of equality before the law on the grounds that alcohol and nicotine are not included in the schedule. The court considers that it has been established that alcohol and nicotine are clearly more dangerous. That cannabis products, than, clearly more dangerous than cannabis products. Although smoking cannabis can lead to lung damage, this is insignificant when compared to the real damage caused by smoking tobacco products. I direct you again to Kane Miscellaneous Authorities, tab 1, page 8. In my submission, Lubeck's equality component also protects growers and dealers. If alcohol and tobacco dealers can be regulated, why can't pot dealers be regulated also? In my submission, what is true for substance orientation is also true for sexual orientation. While it is true that both cannabis use and anal sex may be moderately risky, they are also both acceptably risky and, if done properly, harmless. The connection between both groups of harmless hedonistic deviants is made clear when the ruling in R versus M bracket C is read aloud. It could very well be about young people using cannabis. 
Quote, it strikes me as decidedly inappropriate to deal with health risks at any age by using the punitive force of the criminal code, but especially so for young people. Health risks ought to be dealt with by the health care system. That's at this Appellant's Book of Authorities, tab 8, page 121 and 122. Ayaka Bucci, uh, Justice Ayaka and Justice Corey in Vrend, and again with Justice McLaughlin and Chief Justice McLaughlin and Justice Ayaka Bucci in Corbiere, outlined the standard for inclusion in sex, Section 15 protection. Apparently, the test is that one must be in possession of a quote, historical, social, political, and economic disadvantage, unquote, su suffered because one is in possession of a, quote, deeply personal characteristic that is either unchangeable or changeable only at unacceptable personal cost, unquote. That's at uh, this appellant's book of authorities, tab 13, page 424, and respondent's factum, page 51. If one was inclined to meet this test, one might point out that the fact that in 1991 THC receptors were located in the brain. This might lead us to believe that THC control is a form of self-control and that what is seen as inherently pathological addiction is in fact attraction. Attraction to using our minds and our bodies more effectively. Prohibiting Canadians from using our own THC receptors is an unacceptable personal cost. I direct you to this appellant's record, volume one, page 70. In my submission, the court has set the standard for section 15 inclusion too high. If it's a harmless choice, then it doesn't matter how changeable it is. A line must be drawn, and in my submission, it's better to protect all the harmless people rather than just the unchangeable ones. To conclude, this appellant asks this court to strike down all the cannabis laws. In my submission, they are our greatest shame. And being the first country to remove them entirely will be this country's greatest source of pride for centuries to come. Uh, you may expect some flack from doing this. You might from certain powerful sections of society, but for the vast majority of people all over the world who have an innate feeling deep down inside that they should have the right to self-medicate and control their own lives, you will be heroes to these people. And you'll have support from many strong and powerful sectors of society as well. This appellant feels confident that any remaining doubts you may have can be addressed, for example, the treaty arguments or any of the other arguments that the Crown has. In my submission, this issue is too important to leave any lingering doubts regarding the unconstitutional, unconstitutionality of cannabis prohibition. And I am sure that myself or my co-appellants can address any of the dozens of excuses that the Crown has. Without delay, as soon as possible, to speed up the end of, of the attack on autonomy all over the world, to speed up the end of the mass executions in China and the, the dumping of, of chemicals on Colombia. At the soonest possible opportunity, this court must hand down a decision that eliminates the black market harms associated with black market cannabis use in growing and dealing. And this court must protect human autonomy, which is in essence the freedom to pick and choose our own tastes and pursuits. Now, unless there are any questions or any remaining doubts, again, I stress, don't leave them for your decision. Please hammer away at me right now, right here, when I have a decent chance and a fair chance of addressing them. These are my respectful submissions. Uh, Mr. Malmo-Levine. You can begin, I think, Mr. Conroy. Yeah. 